Congratulations! If you're watching this, then you must have survived the end of the world. Pfft. What do those minds know anyway? Well, everybody's got a Christmas special, so we figured we ought to as well. Coming right up, why was Jesus born in a stable? Why was he crucified with a crown of thorns? And why did wise men from the East come visiting the young Jesus? Believe it or not, this all ties in with Genesis Week. And a welcome to this special edition of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and now carried on ChristianCinema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in Pirate Broadcasting, we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you will find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Here at Genesis Week, we deal primarily with science as it relates to the Bible, and in particular, Genesis and the Creator. Now, we contend that Jesus Christ is the Creator, as witnessed by his many miracles, and specifically identified as such by the Apostles, such as John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was there not anything made that was made. After Jesus had rose from the dead, fulfilling prophecies made hundreds to thousands of years before his birth, he showed himself to Thomas, the doubting disciple, who then called him, My Lord and my God. Jesus did not rebuke him for his exclamation. The first question, why was Jesus born in a stable of all places? Uh, God leaves nothing to chance. He does everything on purpose. Jesus wasn't born in a stable because there was no room at the inn. He was born there to fulfill prophecy. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told to freely eat of all the fruit except for the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned them that, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, of course, we do know that Adam and Eve did eat the fruit, and they did die spiritually that very moment. Now, when they realized they were naked, the question shouldn't be, why didn't they realize this before? But perhaps, what were they clothed in before? However, God did something that I'm sure Adam and Eve never expected. Instead of them dying, God instead took the life of an animal. Now, the Bible simply says it was an animal. However, the Jewish tradition is that it was Adam and Eve's favorite animal, a lamb. God slaughtered an innocent lamb in place of Adam and Eve. He then took the lamb skin and made clothing for Adam and Eve. Notice what happened. Adam and Eve became separated from God because of their sin. They were now ashamed to be in God's presence as a consequence of their sin. God created you and I for relationship. Relationship with God first, as well as each other. God restored their relationship to him by covering up their nakedness. But a lamb had to die in order to restore their relationship. And so we see right in Genesis, at the account of the fall, the representation of the consequences of sin and is what is required to restore our relationship to God. Furthermore, notice what God said to Lucifer regarding Eve. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. God didn't talk about the seed of Adam, but the offspring of Eve. This was the first specific prophecy of a redeemer who would crush Satan's head and alluding to the virgin birth. Now let's jump ahead to the first Christmas. Why was Christ born in a manger? 
Well, the clue comes from his introduction by John the Baptist, who called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Christ being laid in a manger was symbolic of his purpose on earth and a nod to Genesis. He was to restore the relationship between God the Father and man by becoming the sacrificial lamb and dying in place of you and I. He was born of a virgin, truly God and human. Now the question of the day everybody asks when it comes to science at Christmas is, what was the star of Bethlehem? But before we answer that question, we should ask the question, who were the Magi? The wise men from the east that came to worship the newborn king. Now for those not familiar with the story of Christ's birth, you can read the account in the first few chapters of the book of Matthew in the Bible. There we find that Matthew records the visit of mysterious wise men from the east who came to worship Christ, the newborn king of the Jews, who had seen the newborn king's star. Now, Dr. Ethel Nelson teamed up with co-authors Richard Broadbury and Samuel Wang to write The Beginning of the Chinese Characters. Now, this was a fascinating translation of the ancient Chinese characters. The written Chinese language is one of the oldest languages out there, probably created almost immediately after the Tower of Babel, which is interesting because the Chinese characters are composed of separate parts called radicals, which are pictograms or hieroglyphs. Older languages were created out of pictograms because all of these cultures had just experienced the loss of communication. God changed the languages of all the people, and suddenly they were unable to communicate with each other. So by designing pictogram-based languages, they could potentially communicate with other language groups. The designers of the original Chinese language also built in the history of Earth, which matches the creation account of the Bible. For example, the character for Garden is a square with a cross in the middle. Now, the cross actually represents four rivers. Now, why on earth would the character for Garden have four rivers coming out of its center, except that in Genesis we read of the first garden, the Garden of Eden. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. In fact, many of these Chinese characters make no sense whatsoever unless you have an understanding of the creation account in Genesis. The word for clothes or clothing in Hebrew is especially interesting as it is only one character different from the Hebrew word for God's glory. So it would appear that Adam and Eve were originally clothed in God's glory, which they lost when they rebelled against God. Well, the words for naked and clothes in the original Chinese characters is also very interesting. The character for naked also means the color red and has the same symbol of a man with fire, which is the same symbol in the Chinese character set that is used to describe God's glory. It is also interesting that the character for naked also means red as in the color. Uh, this is interesting because as you tour around the world, over and over again, you see different legends and myths in different cultures referring to the first created man as being red-skinned because he was made from red earth. Now, why would the Chinese character for naked include a man, fire, and red? It makes sense when you look at it from the biblical creation account. The first man was red-skinned and clothed in God's glory, naked and yet not ashamed. However, as we know from Genesis, Adam and Eve then sinned and apparently lost this glory of God and suddenly found themselves naked. Which brings us to the Chinese character for clothes, which is composed of essentially three radicals, to cover and two people. Now what's interesting is that the second person in the hieroglyph is coming out of the side of the first. This makes complete sense in the light of the crea Genesis creation account, where Eve was created from a rib in Adam's side, and the two needed clothes after sinning. 
But the creator god originally worshipped by the Chinese emperors is the most interesting. Called Shang Di, the character for Shang Di is composed of four radicals. The trinity of God, the Father, the God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, is evident in the graph four, center, place, or moral pattern. So we first see a person with attributes of God, but there's three represented within the graph. And so we see that a moral pattern is a person with the qualities of a three-part God. The graph to manifest or show or proclaim or exhibit is composed of two parts, a complete person from above. And so we see more obvious symbolism of God coming down to earth, manifesting himself as a man. We also find the symbol for a tree and the subtly different graph for fuel, sticks as a fuel for sacrifice. Now, when we compose all the graphs together, we find that Shang Di is best described as Jesus Christ, the Trinity with a man, the God man from above, who was nailed to a tree and became the fuel for a sacrifice. Shang Di is Jesus Christ. And he was worshipped by the Chinese emperors with an annual sacrifice for more than 4,000 years at the western border. The Chinese knew about God's promise of a Messiah, God who would come to earth in the flesh, the king of all kings. Yet the ancients of China preserved God's promises and his instructions for many centuries, even continuing the annual sacrifice. Confucius was probably the greatest compiler of all of China's ancient writings. Confucius was baffled by what a previous sage, Leo Zi, had called the Tao. Confucius concluded that the Tao was beyond human understanding. As Wang and Nelson documented in God and the Ancient Chinese, Leo Zi described the Tao, I do not know his name. Name him Tao, possibly. For lack of a better word, I call him the Almighty. And the Tao exists as one. One exists as two. Two exists as three. And three created everything. An obvious nod to the Trinity. The Tao was also the name ascribed to the sacred doctrines handed down over the eons. Uh, Confucius passed on or transmitted the Tao to Mencius, his student who was the last of the great sages. Now, Mencius made a remarkable prophecy in his book, The Works of Mencius. Mencius said, from Yao to Shun, down to Tang, were 500 years and more. As to Yu and Ao Teo, they saw those earlier sages and knew their doctrines, while Tang heard their doctrines as transmitted and so knew them. From Tang to King Wen were 500 years and more. As to Yi Ying and Lei Zhu, they saw Tang and knew his doctrines, while King Wen heard them as transmitted and so knew them. From King Wen to Confucius were 500 years and more. As to Te Gong Wang and San Yi Sheng, they saw Wen and so knew his doctrines, while Confucius heard them as transmitted and so knew them. If that was the case of time then, it should be the same now. The king should arise in the course of 500 years. And during that time, there should be men illustrious in their generation. So the sages of China knew to look for a king, not a sage to carry on the Tao, but the mysterious Tao himself. When we chart out Mencius's 2,000-year uh, king prophecy, you can see his prophecy lines up with the birth of Christ, but with one twist. Notice what Mencius said about the coming king. If truly a king were to arise, it would still require 30 years for his love to be manifested. We read in the scriptures that Christ did not start his ministry until 30 years of age. So we see Chinese sages to the east of Israel awaiting the king from heaven to arrive right around the time Christ was born. They were looking for this king the Tao himself. It would make sense that the creator who made the stars of the heavens for, 
signs, seasons, and times would use them to announce the birth of the Savior, the Messiah. So just what was that star that the wise men from the East followed? Well, we don't really know because we weren't there and those details were not recorded in the Bible. However, there was considerable fascinating speculations regarding this star. Now, it should be noted that, contrary to what is popularly portrayed in nativity scenes around the world, the wise men from the East did not visit Jesus at the time of his birth. It was many months afterwards. The wise men asked around Jerusalem where the new king was born, which troubled King Herod. King Herod inquired of the Jewish priests where Jesus would be born, and they pointed to scripture, which said it would be the town of Bethlehem. So Herod sent the wise men to Bethlehem and asked them to come back and tell him when they had found the newborn king, allegedly so he could come worship a king as well. Now, after finding Jesus and being warned of God in a dream not to return to Herod, the wise men went back home a different route. Herod, after realizing the wise men weren't coming back, then slaughtered all of the children in Bethlehem, two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Herod had asked the wise men when the star appeared and slaughtered the children accordingly. Jesus was probably born in 3 BC, most likely in September. So what was happening in the night skies during this time? <laughs> Plenty, as you can read for yourself in Dr. Baugh's excellent article here. We see Christ, the Messiah, referred to by a number of symbolic names throughout the scriptures, as the Lion of Judah, the bright and morning star, the king whose throne would be established forever from the line of King David. Now, with all of this in mind, you can start to grasp the significance of the signs in the stars at the time of Christ's birth, as explained by Dr. Baugh, who expounded upon the works of Ernest L. Martin. On August 12, 3 BC, Jupiter rose as a morning star, which soon came into conjunction with Venus. That started Jupiter off on a journey in which six conjunctions with other planets and the star Regulus took place. The final planetary union was the massing of the planets, which occurred with Mars, Venus, and Mercury on August 27th, 2 BC. Jupiter then became stationary for a brief time over Bethlehem on December 25th, 2 BC, uh, looking towards Bethlehem from Jerusalem. At the inception of this scenario, here was Jupiter, the king planet, which had just united with Venus, the mother, now joining itself with the king star Regulus, the star of the Jewish Messiah, in Leo the Lion, the constellation of Judah, while the sun, the supreme father of the ruler, was then located in Virgo, the Virgin. A series of remarkable signs in the skies indeed. And with wise men coming from the east looking for the king's coming, they had their eyes peeled on the stars above and responded to tr by trying to find the child king, which they did and were rewarded for their search. But why was Jesus born as a human in the first place? Well, it's pretty simple. If we disobey God, we must die. He must keep his word. But then we have a problem. Every single one of us deserves to die because all have sinned against God. This perfect world was corrupted by sin. What is sin? Well, sin is defined in Genesis. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. That was sin. The consequences that followed corrupted the world. Their relationship with God and each other was disrupted. They were ashamed to be around God and hid themselves. Death entered into the world. Thorns now grew. Pain was multiplied. The killing of the animal in the garden was symbolic and served the purpose of restoring the relationship between Adam and Eve and their creator. This is why an animal sacrifice was instituted, so the people would have a constant reminder of the price to be paid for sin. But killing an animal did not fix the problem of sin and a corrupted world. People were still guilty of sin, and the present creation was corrupted. The Creator must make a new heaven and a new earth, uncorrupted and perfect. Now, do you think God is going to allow even one ounce of sin into that new heaven and new earth? Well, of course not. But that ultimately means neither you 
nor I, nor any of us will be allowed into the new heaven and new earth. So Jesus created a body to live in so that he was truly human and truly God. Truly human to live a sinless life and be the only one ever in all of earth's history to earn his way into the new heaven and new earth. But he had to be fully God in order to live such a life. And so once he had done this, he then died the death you and I deserve and paid the consequences of our sin. What are the consequences? Head back to Genesis and go through the list. He suffered tremendous pain, a consequence of sin. While our representations of Christ always cover him up, he was crucified naked. Why? Because the shame of nakedness was one of the consequences of sin. He was crowned with a crown of thorns. Why thorns? Because thorns were a consequence of sin in the Garden of Eden. He died. Death was a consequence of sin. He then rose from the dead to show he had defeated the consequences of sin and to show that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Like Adam and Eve were clothed in the skins of the sacrificial lamb in Eden to cover their shame and the consequences of their sin and restore their relationship to God, Christ also covers you. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 3.27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You put on Christ in a spiritual sense, like clothes. When God sees you, he no longer sees the sin, but his own perfect son who had to die in order for you to be clothed. Everything about Christ refers back to Genesis. The promise of his coming made to Eve in the garden. His birth of a woman his defeating of Satan, the reason for his birth and his death, all ties in to Genesis. He died that you might live. But in order to live, you need to give your life to him. Admit that you are a sinner and in need of salvation. Believe that he died in your place and live your life as if you were living as if you were him here on earth. We are promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, our comforter and guide while we are here, living in this place and representing him. Now, there are only two kingdoms to inherit. The new heaven and new earth, or the lake of fire, promised to the devil and his angels. That punishment was never intended for man. But if you reject the inheritance of God, our creator, then you choose the only other inheritance, the inheritance of punishment for his enemies. All you have to do is embrace the inheritance, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, and ask him to give you the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. If you haven't, you should pray that prayer right now, which is just talking to Jesus. Confess your sins and ask him to forgive you, and you will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit and welcomed into the family of God and his inheritance. Woohoo! Mail for me! Hmm. I solicited questions on Facebook for our Christmas special and got both some interesting questions as well as interesting discussion and responses. Oren wrote in, How likely is it that a mutant reindeer could be born with a bioluminescent nose? <laughs> I know that genetic engineering has produced bioluminescent mammals, but what are the odds that it could happen naturally? And supposing it did happen, would natural selection favor a nose that glows? Or, as the song suggests, would other reindeer reject the mutant and refuse to breed with them? <laughs> Matthew then asked, could a mutation cause a bioluminescent nose? Or would that require new genetic information? Brendan responded with, wouldn't they all have had bioluminescent noses first, then lose that trait further on down the line as it no longer served a useful function? <laughs> yes, on all accounts. While bioluminescence does exist within the creation, having a bioluminescent nose would cause multiple problems, such as blinding the creature's night vision instead of enhancing it. Not to mention, natural selection would probably play a role here. It's pretty hard to hide from hunters and prey when your nose glows in the dark. That makes for lousy camouflage. And if you're blinded by the light and running around in the dark, chances are much better that you'll 
run off a cliff or run into a tree or something. As for a creature like a deer to develop bioluminescence, it would definitely be an example of new information, as the creature would have to develop ways to produce multiple chemicals, as well as mixing them together and containing them, etc. Bioluminescence is not a simple process. So I say all that to that, I say all that to say this, Rudolph doesn't exist because the deer with glowing noses became extinct through natural selection, a loss of information and a loss of genetic variation in the gene pool. <laughs> Rick wrote in, how about why is snow so unique? I was walking around in our first snowfall the other day and thinking about, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Snow is a fascinating substance. During the phase transition from water to ice, the water molecules uh, slow down bouncing against each other, slower and slower as the heat is removed. Eventually, the molecules attracted to each other like magnets snap into position uh, relative to each other. Now, you know how magnets have poles and thus they tend to want to snap together in a specific way? Well, the water molecule is like that, only it has multiple poles. And so the variation you can get in a snowflake is incredible. Uh, the variation is determined by the water content in the air and the temperature. Now, contrary to what we're all told, though, there are types of snowflakes where the variation is very limited, and thus you can have two snowflakes that are alike. As for the color of snow, T. Chapman did respond to Rick with a correct answer. The snow isn't actually white, it's simply refracting the light, changing it, in essence. Now, just like the colors of a bird aren't actually there, you are seeing the feathers refract the light into specific colors. Uh, so it's interesting that the Bible refers to our sins being like scarlet, yet Jesus makes us white as snow. Jesus changes us, refracts God's view of us, if you will, so that we appear to be as white as snow before the Father. It is a powerful symbolization of his grace, mercy, uncovering. Well, that's it for this week's show. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off and saying thank you for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next Genesis week. You can send in your comments to us in a number of ways. Hope you had a Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a Happy New Year. Remember the words of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the reason for the season, and showed us that He was the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Him. We'll see you next week. We need your support to help keep this program on the air. You can help by making a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K2P4. You can also sign up for Ian's newsletter, detailing current research and news items at ianjuby.org.